What's up guys? Considering we did Sneasel a few weeks ago, I was waiting for you guys to send me this one. That's right, it's Gligar. Another Pokemon that was introduced in Gen 2 that didn't evolve, but then it later got an evolution in Gen 4. Though due to its 4 times weakness to ice, Gligar would probably get bought by Sneasel. Gligar might look scary, but in the anime, Ash's Gligar actually was a sweetie and a bit of a crybaby. I guess its face is a little adorable if you're into the whole big tongue thing. And yeah, even after it evolved, it was honestly pretty adorable there too. As long as that stinger doesn't get you. And in the anime, Gligar was afraid of battling until it evolved into Gliscor. So let's see if there was a reason for that. How good was Gligar and Gliscor actually? And in this video, we'll be covering these competitive formats. If you remember our video on Sneasel, you might know what's coming here. Gligar's typing is good situationally, but its stats and move pool are what let it down. 105 defense is its biggest claim to fame, which doesn't mean much when your attack is only 75, and when on the other side of defenses you've only got 65 base HP and special defense. Gligar's typing is interesting. It packs in two immunities to extremely common types and three resistances, while only taking super effective damage from two types. Unfortunately, those two types, water and ice, are some of the most common attack types in the game, and that 4x weakness to ice means an icy wind is enough to knock Gligar over, especially since his special defense was so bad. Gligar's stats lend it to tanking, but it lacks the support move pool to do anything on that route either. Counter was its one hope to pick up surprise kills on Snorlax or Skarmory, with Gligar's only other hope being to screech on Switch and use the defense drop to artificially boost its own sad attacks, just like another bat Pokemon we've talked about, but at least that one evolved by now. To make matters worse, Gligar couldn't even learn Earth Quake via a TM in Gen 2. To get access to its strongest stab attack, you needed to beat the rival in Pokemon Stadium 2, and even then, Earthquake and Wing Attack didn't do much with such poor attack stats. Gligar's one other niche was in the use of Thief, which was a pretty situational solution to Pokemon like Thick Club Marowak or Leftover Snorlax. Gligar's decent defense would allow it to get a rest off eating its own Mint Berry, or it could just play Status Absorption with a Miracle Berry and Protect. Then, it could make use of its actually pretty okay speed to get a Thief off, and then promptly be pretty useless after that. Yeah, Gligar was no hot stuff in Gen 2. It was an underuse, and even there it did poorly, through losing matchups to most water flying and ice types. And just like Sneasel in Gen 3, Gligar also received a goodie bag of buffs that made its status as a single stage Pokemon not quite as distressing. Chief among them was its expanded move pool, which now boasts an Iron Tail, a more accessible Earthquake, Hidden Power Flying, and the crown jewel in both Gligar and Sneasel's Gen 3 sets, Swords Dance. Gligar's attack was still pretty meh, but with Swords Dance, those stats Stab Earthquake suddenly had a good deal of oomph behind them, and 85 speed wasn't completely terrible for sweeping in the lower tiers. Combined with Hyper Cutter, Gligar was Intimidate immune and had an easy time finding switches due to its good typing. It could even swap out its Swords Dance and Leftovers for Quick Attack and a Choice Band to Revenge Kill, though its middling attack stat became more evident without Swords Dance boost. Finally, Select Berry with Endure or Substitute could be very powerful if the enemy's priority users were taken care of. Make no mistake though, Gligar was still underused, as its stats paled in comparison to heavy hitters like Swampert, Aerodactyl, and especially Flygon, who strictly outclassed it as a ground type. But provided it avoided water types like Quagsire, Blastoise, and Slowking, it did quite well in underuse, even able to take out the levitating celestial rocks of Solrock and Lunatone with Iron Tail and some proper prediction. If you were surprised that Gligar wasn't completely terrible in Gen 3, here's a little present for you in Gen 4. A brand new evolution complete with a 20 stat boost to attack and defense, and 10 points in every other stat. That huge buff paired nicely with Gliscor's new moves, which allowed it to branch out into supportive roles it had the stats for before, but couldn't fulfill while patching up its attack stats. One thing to differentiate in Pokemon is a wall breaker versus a stall breaker. While many stall teams function based on walls, they also utilize recovery tactics, protect, and status like burn and poison to eventually win the game. A wall breaker such as the grossly powerful Mega Gardevoir we discussed last video literally breaks through those walls with its sheer power. A stall breaker, such as the most standard Gliscor set from Gen 4, usually has power combined with other utilities to neuter would-be stallers. In Gliscor's case, its own bug combined with Roost let it stay healthy, and Toxic and Taunt make Pokemon reluctant to stay in or unable to pull off their own prolonging tactics. But this set wouldn't be possible without Earthquake. Having that offensive presence is necessary, so it doesn't lose to Steel types or teams with proper cleric support. It's the great stat spread that allows Gliscor to play an off-tank role that let him effectively stall break. That same off-tank designation is what benefits Gliscor as a lead, where he gives up Toxic for Stealth Rock. With his good speed and typing, Gliscor could reliably beat Earthquake weak leads, and the choice of U-turn versus Taunt let him play the momentum game as well. 
Oh, and don't think we forgot about Swords Dance Gliscor. Gliscor's bulk let him act as one of the stickiest sweepers around with a boost because of his combination of recovery, bulk, and power. Power was nominally his weakest point, but with Swords Dance and Life Orb, anything that didn't outspeed Gliscor would have a hard time stopping it as it could easily win Wars of Attrition and take advantage of weaker Pokemon to top off its health. Finally, Gliscor made for a very strong Baton Passer. That same bulk meant getting off Rock Polish or Swords Dance, or sometimes even both, could be a cinch, especially since Gliscor can switch in on Earthquake. The real strength of this set was Taunt, effectively stopping any phasing attempts, which did mean the set had no attacks, yes, but if you could get a Swords Dance off and Rock Polish to a teammate, who needs attacks on Gliscor? Gliscor's counters remained the same as before its evolution. Bulky Water types and fast special attackers. In particular, Gyarados beat any non-Stone Edge variants, and Swapper and Suicune packed both Roar and Ice Beam to handle any Gliscor set. While Skarmory didn't appreciate Taunt or Stone Edge, its high defenses let it handle Gliscor nicely. Finally, Starmie outsped Gliscor and hit him extremely hard, especially getting past the 2 8 KO mark that made Roost Spam less viable. But with all that said, a lot of Pokemon lost to Bulky Waters, and Gliscor fit a tanky physical role not many Pokemon have the spread, typing, or move pool for. Gliscor had all three, for Gen 4, Overuse was its domain. Gen 5 only brought good things to Gliscor. The influx of fighting types and Overuse meant Gliscor's resistances to punches put it in high demand, but the real kicker was its addition of its Dream World ability, Poison Heal, which it abused to become even more annoying than Breath. With Toxic Orb, Gliscor had an extreme amount of healing that also couldn't be stopped by knockoff unless it was on turn 1, and meant it was immune to status. With Poison Heal, Gliscor became an even stronger wall. With Substitute and Toxic, it could continually whittle down the opponent, and any counters would still take an Earthquake for their troubles while trying to take it down. Ironically enough, this set was weak to Steel types, as Toxic was Gliscor's main sources of damage, and they usually had the defenses to shrug off those Earthquakes. Trying to break through Gliscor though just led to frustration. It was those who could win the War of Attrition with phasing or hazards of their own that did well. But this set was one of the most maddening in the game to go up against if you weren't prepared, and so frequently that could be the case. Defensive Gliscor made use of Roost and Poison Heal to neutralize common and physical attackers. The subtoxic necessary investment in speed meant exceedingly powerful physical attackers could still handle Gliscor, but this set had nothing to fear from almost every physical threat. With a grab bag of moves to pull from, potential checks almost always had one move to fear. You didn't want to switch in your Salamence and try to set up only to be taunted or worse, Ice Fang. The offensive Gliscor set mostly fell off the map due to Lander Styrian, but it still had one set it could run. Acrobatics boosted by a flying gem was effectively a 247 base power attack, and just like before, it wasn't that hard for Gliscor to get up a Swords Dance. Earthquake and Acrobatics formed such a powerful core on their own that Gliscor could even run Substitute or Agility in an effort to become a bona fide sweeper. But as always, the set struggled against bulky waters. Finally, while the addition of the Laddies and Pokemon of the Strong Ice types meant the investment into Paton Pass was less viable, Gliscor Gliscor could still fill that role, biding its time until it could switch in. This was usually just to pass a substitute to a teammate who could use it to set up, which in some cases was quite useful, and Gliscor's bulk, access to taunt, and immunity to status made it well suited to do so. Gliscor's biggest problem was that it still faced stiff competition from Landorus T, you know, the other ground flying type with good stats. This is why any offensive set not taking advantage of the flying gem fell completely off the radar. As such, it was Gliscor's defensive sets that came to the fore, and frequently it was things that shut down defense that helped dispatch it, like Roar Run from Skarmory or Taunt from Gyarados for example. Rotom Wash could also hit and power ice through substitutes and only took damage from Toxic. Skarmory Fortress and Ferrothorn abused No Taunt Gliscor to set up hazards and gain momentum. The main problem in dealing with Gliscor was letting it get a substitute up, which it was admittedly very good at doing, but without it, its old counters Starmie and other water types ran it down, especially in the rain, as did especially strong physical ice type attacks from the likes of Conqueror, Lucario, and Mamoswine. The laddies could switch in on Earthquake and potentially hit Gliscor with a Surf, and other strong special attackers that could avoid Earthquake like Gengar or Air Balloon Heatran fared well too. But really, Gliscor could be an exceedingly hard Pokemon to deal with. The best counter was a good game plan, as it had layer upon layer of setup to contend with once it got going. If dealt with intelligently, Gliscor could be a mere blip on the road to victory, but if not, it was gonna make you suffer. It was solidly overused and even made soldiers into Ubers off the back of its status as perhaps the best ground encounter in the game. Because Gliscor was such a setup based Pokemon, it's nominally not a great doubles Pokemon. However, we haven't yet talked about one of its abilities, Sandvale. 
which was banned in singles. Acrobat Gliscor could provide tailwind support, spread damage, and a potential miss that could turn the game in sand. And on the other end of the spectrum, Tank Gliscor made one side of the field that was immune to status. Tailwind was the name of the game here, but at the end of the day, Gliscor was thoroughly suboptimal choice for a team, mostly being outclassed by Landers T in every regard, who took its great typing and backed it up with monstrous attack. Its one claim to fame was a 25th place at Worlds 2013 on the team of a fan favorite Wolf Glick, who paired it with Hippowdon, Magmar, and Registeel in a typical offbeat Wolf fashion. Gen 6 saw Gliscor return to stall breaking as its primary role. More fairy types and fewer steel types equals less fighting types, which equals less defensive Gliscor. Not to mention the cadre of strong special attackers added in like Mega Manetric, Mega Altaria, Mega Charizard Y, all gave defensive Gliscor reasons to be scared. In short, power creep forced Gliscors out of its generalized tank role and more into its specific niche as Stallbreaker, which to be fair, it was still great at. The mix of Source Dance, Taunt, Toxic, Knockoff, Roost, and Poison Heal let it assault defensive teams from multiple angles, alternately punching through their defenses, prohibiting them from using their moves, wearing them down, and removing items. Gliscor worked well as an aid to set up Pokemon like Celebi, Reuniclus, and Talonflame, who all appreciated its ability to potentially move the Pokemon, inhibiting them from blasting through the enemy team. As far as counters go, it was an old hat plus some new power. Alongside the expected water types, Mega Metagross, Mega Venusaur, and Mega Scissor all exploited the fact that Gliscor's defenses weren't quite what they used to be, all benefiting from the immunity to either Earthquake or Toxic. But Stahl's prevalence meant Gliscor's good stats kept it in overuse for the time being. And as for Gen 6 VGC, though we did find one instance of it making a top 8 at 2014 Australian Regional, no sets or video of this were recorded. And as for the general use amongst the general players, yeah, I can't really find anything on Gliscor other than record of some people using it in earlier rounds, nor could I find much movesets. Again, it's not really known to be a VGC Pokemon, especially with Landorus T being a thing post-2014. And that's it, so how good were Gligar and Gliscor actually? Well, Gligar wasn't great, but Gliscor was awesome. It's truly one of the most annoying Pokemon to fight against if you ever face it, as it makes Poison Hill look even better than Breloom does. What was once a terrible move pull has evolved to be frankly massive, leaving Gliscor Gliscor with all its tools it's needed to make use of its unique stat spread. Gliscor's move pool made it a constant threat. I have bad memories of thinking I had scouted a set correctly only to eat a flying gem acrobatics or an ice fang that brought me into a screeching halt. So yeah, Gliscor, pretty good. Now let's hope it didn't get too power creeped out in Gen 7. Thanks for watching everyone. As always, if you liked the video and want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False White Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content, and of course, comment on what Pokemon you want to see next. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to all of you as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next week, everyone.